Welcome to Uncovered. It's Wednesday. I'm Anthony Davis. He's Ron Filipkowski. And together we uncover the MAGA propaganda that is not covered so much by the mainstream media. As much as they like to try, Ron, I really feel this endless failure. Uh, so we'll just try and fill in the gaps where we can. Thanks to you for joining us. Uh, we are always thrilled to have... Um, a, uh, a live audience to this live show and so feel free to comment and uh, you know there's a live comments and you can comment afterwards and there's also an audio podcast version of this which you can get later tonight. Uh, Ron we have lots to uncover don't we where, where should we start today should we start with um, his lordship uh, the, the former guy Orange Jesus <laughs> by the way speaking of live comments I, I watched yeah. the RFK Jr announcement of his vp pick yesterday yeah and i was watching the live comments and i i can say that 90 90 percent of his people who are his fans that were commenting were very unhappy with his choice and his pick and and so that that was rather interesting i, yeah, I think he, he lost a lot of people yesterday well he just chose someone who's rather wealthy right so that he can you know i guess try and be in with that with that set yeah, I mean, what they what they wanted, what his people wanted, was definitely like a medical, you know, conspiracy theorist, anti vaxxer and I think she's more of like a traditional liberal. I don't know a lot about her, but they definitely were not happy. <laughs> we we should actually remind people at this point that a vote for RFK Jr. is effectively a vote for Donald Trump. And I think that that message needs to get out. You know, we don't even know if, if RFK is going to make it to November. But if he does, any vote that is not for the Democrats is effectively a vote for, for Donald Trump himself. Absolutely. You know, um, I think that Trump was very happy with how that went yesterday. He posted yep. about it. Yeah. Uh, he was celebrating. His people were celebrating because he felt that... Um, RFK was pulling votes for him from him, and uh, he thinks that this uh, this VP choice is going to help them move people off him. and And I have noticed that it, you know, there, like I said, some of the RFK MAGA crossover people were were not happy with how it went yesterday. So he's definitely a problem. Um, and I think you know it'll be interesting to see because the Biden campaign is taking the strategy of completely ignoring him and right. not talking about him. So, so his I, family, interestingly. Yeah, but I I think down the stretch we're probably going to see some anti, you know, RFK Jr. stuff aimed at liberal Democrats. Yeah, uh, you know, to to try and move them away from him. Donald Trump has, um, despite having a bit of a windfall, uh, he's not allowed to touch the money for six months, but he's taken Truth Social public, and it is was going to be valued at six million, and today they were talking about nine million. And I mean, this is a, an insane. It says uh, Trump media generated just three point four million dollars worth of this is from your tweet. I seem to remember uh, of revenue from the first nine months last year, according to filings. The company lost forty nine million dollars over that span. And yet the market is valuing Trump media at approximately nine billion dollars, uh, which I think what Trump is entitled to half of or a third of eventually. I think he he owns like sixty seven percent of the stock, like two thirds. Yeah, right. so that's actually a, a cutout that I took from uh, I think a Washington Post article. Uh, but those numbers are reported pretty much everywhere. This is a company that takes in no money, uh, loses a lot of money, um, has no no value. I mean, uh, uh, it, it's just crazy to me that you have all these speculators. And, in, and investors who are putting in all this money to pump up this stock price, which they have been doing. Yesterday, the stock was up pretty significantly day one. Today, it's been relatively flat, you know, as the day's gone on. I've, I've been kind of keeping an eye on it. But you got to believe, and I think a lot of the experts do believe, that there is going to be a major crash. Yes. And the stocks, because there's just no, there's no value here. If you look at the product itself, the advertising isn't there. Uh, the only advertisers on there are like people selling Trump bobbleheads. You know, there, there's no real advertising. People selling Trump products and trinkets. Um, you look at the users who are there. You don't even have members of Congress there. I, I did a search. I went through every about six months ago. I went through every senator and every Republican member of the House. There was like three senators on there and like 13 House members. That is it. I mean, when I checked Lauren Boebert, for example, 
wasn't even on Truth Social. Gates wasn't on there. I mean, these are like major Trump fans are not even on his platform. Then I went through like the Fox hosts and the Newsmax hosts. Most of them are not on there. Yeah. There's no celebrities on there. You know, it, it's just I, I'm struggling to figure out how anyone could be investing a significant amount of money in this enterprise. Remember, he set up Truth Social when he got banned from Twitter years ago, right? So he didn't right. have anywhere to put his propaganda. So he was like, well, I can do my own. And then initially there were so many technical problems. Remember, the launch was a disaster. And then eventually he kind of gets it up and running. But the, the platform is very buggy. So you know, it doesn't have the kind of investment that, that Twitter had. And if you think about how huge that machine became before Elon Musk came and gutted it and you know changed its function. Incidentally, we should mention that Elon Musk this week has come out batting for Donald Trump 100%. In that weird interview he did with Don Lemon, he was like, well, I haven't decided yet, but it's not going to be Biden. He's put his cards very much on the table now, hasn't he? he? He's going to endorse Trump. I predicted that for a few months now. There's no doubt in my mind he's going to do it. He's just going to kind of wait towards the end, I think, and ish. But you know, the other thing is Trump's Twitter account was reinstated by Musk a year That's ago. Right. Yes, and he hasn't really used it. He's, he hasn't used it at all. He, he tweeted one thing. And, and yeah. I think that the reason is because of the stock. I mean, that yes. he has clearly got a deal there where he is signed with the principal investors not to go on Twitter. Because the reality is, once Trump starts posting on Twitter, there's no reason for anyone to be on True Social. <laughs> right. True Social is yeah. gone. Yeah. There, th he's the only thing that even keeps anybody on that platform. And pe some people say, uh, uh, well, by the way, I think that that, you know, that's hurting his campaign. I mean, uh, tr Twitter was instrumental to Trump getting elected in 16 and instrumental in his 2020 campaign where he had 82 million followers that he could interact with all throughout the day. And people say, well, you know, you guys are posting some of his screenshots over over there on on Twitter. It's not even close to the same. People don't realize he makes 35, 40 posts a day on True Social. We might screenshot two or three of the nuttiest ones, but the vast majority of the stuff that he's putting out is not getting outside True Social and, and, and in a big way. So I think it's this conundrum where on the one hand, going back on Twitter is going to really help with his campaign, I think, messaging, but it would kill his stock price so he is obviously choosing the money. And, and Truth Social is the only place he could really make any money at the moment. If you consider his prospects, he doesn't have the ability to get loans anymore. He's obviously burnt his bridges with, with banks and investors. And so, you know, he, he really is relying on Truth Social to be this cash cow for him. He wants to keep his nose clean for six months, then get a big payout. So, and, you know, not to mention between now and then, Obviously, we, there's this fine, this $450 million fine to the, to the court that he's been un unable to pay um, because he doesn't have the cash at the moment, despite Alina Haber saying he's got the cash and despite him saying he's got the cash, but clearly he doesn't. Just explain why the court reduced that to $175 million. Because, you know, for a lot of us, <laughs> we were like, here we go again, Trump gets off lightly. I, I know well, that why that, was that? I, I, you know, first of all, they just picked a number out of the air. I think that they just felt was fair. You know, like there, there really has never been a civil Trump is right about one thing. There's really never been a civil judgment like that where somebody has needed to post a bond to save their business um, of that size before. So I think that they were sort of dealing with that. But I think, I think what I tried to explain to Democrats, if you have to step back and sort of remember how we got here. This is not some kind of win for Trump. I mean, no. the original case when it was filed was filed for $250 million. That is how much Letitia James was seeking. And Trump world and all the right wingers thought that that amount was just absolutely preposterous and crazy and insane. So here we have him at the end of the case posting a $175 million bond, which he hasn't done yet, but he's going to have to going to have to do that with another 200 and something million hanging over his head if he loses in addition yeah. to that. So this is not some horrible, you know, result 
oh, when you look at the big picture of things, I know Democrats were disappointed that they sort of threw him this lifeline. But in the grand scheme of things, him having to put up one hundred and seventy five million, still owing a bunch more and then rolling into his criminal trial in New York. That's not a win. No, I, sp I suppose what's frustrating. I mean, I think I tweeted something along the lines of I wonder if they'll reduce the cost of my parking ticket to make it a little more affordable. And, th and that's really how it feels, you know, because this is a state charge and for some reason it gets slashed by 60 percent. And, and, and it, I suppose it's not really explained. And we should be clear, this is because of all of, his, all of his various kind of criminal cases. This is the one where he overvalued his properties and tried to, you know, give the impression he was wealthier than he was. Right. But the also thing, the, the also the interesting thing is going to be where is he going to come up with the 175 million because yeah. you know when he was asked about this he said well you know the what his first response was well we'll see you know and then and then a reporter sort of got um snarky with him and said are you saying that you, you know you don't have the cash to put it up in cash and then he turned around and he, he was walking out when he was asked that question and he turned around and he said it'll be cash yeah and and i think that's one of those things where it's the false bravado where you know, you, you you lash out and you get mad. And then five seconds later, you instantly go, uh oh, you know, yeah. I <laughs> why did I just say that? Well, this I is his Achilles he, heel, isn't it? He spent he may his have whole life pretending moments. that he's wealthier than he is. And this right. is the proof that he's a fraud. I I, I think that we were going to watch this. He is not going to put this up in cash. He is going to use a bonding company that he will pay, you know, $20 million and not get that $20 million back. That's going to come out of his pocket. Yeah. Um, but I, and then and then we're going to be able to mock him once again for claiming he was going to put it up in cash and he didn't. And amongst all this, we're now seeing videos. I'm sure you're getting them on your feeds as well from Don Jr. begging for even a dollar. Even a dollar will help us to fight those communists, which is what I heard Trump saying on one of them this morning. And I would love to know what he thinks exactly is communist about democrats but anyway that's a conversation for another day so now in a true kind of sacrilegious fashion he is now selling a trump branded bible let's take a look in connection with promoting the god bless the usa bible this bible is the king james version and also includes our founding father documents yes the constitution which i'm fighting for every single day very hard to keep Americans protected. Also, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the Pledge of Allegiance are all part of this. God bless the USA Bible. And it's just very important and very important to me. I want to have a lot of people have it. You have to have it for your heart, for your soul. What the bejesus <laughs> is he talking about? The first thing I would say about that is, why is he not facing the camera in either shot? So with the face on shot, he's like standing sideways and looking that way. And then when they cut to the side shot, he's not looking in the camera either. It's a profile. It's, it's the, who's filming that? Is Eric filming that or something? Tiffany? He, he definitely, I think it's Dan Scavino is the one right. who's doing it, who's his social media guy. Yeah. Um, because he does all of, all of this stuff. Uh, and he's he's big on dramatics, and so is Trump. Trump loves Gavino's work. It needs smoke. They need a smoke machine. I think that would, and some backlighting. I think that would really close the deal. I mean, this is just unbelievable. Uh, every time you think he can't get any more ridiculous, he does. And this is this is a Bible that Lee, you know, Lee Greenwood has been living off this one song, you know, the Trump rally theme song that has yes. been used. In, previous to that the god god bless for like America, 25 so. years you yeah. know what i mean this yeah. is like his he's like the one hit wonder now and he parlayed at that into he's been selling these bibles for a few years greenwood basically out of his like his garage you know and he's been he even has posted videos of himself uh which we just posted on our midas website today where he's like loading up the bibles in his in the back of his car <laughs> in his trunk to drive him to the post office. Right. And there's a lot of complaints. You can go to his Amazon page and there's a lot of complaints on there and one star reviews from people that complain that it takes like months for them to get their Bibles after they order them because Lee's, you know, packing them himself and yeah. putting them in his car. 
So obviously somewhere along the line, because Lee is at Mar-a-Lago a lot, um, he probably pitched to Trump, hey, I'm struggling with this business. Can I use your name and, you know, maybe in a fusion of cash, who knows, put your name on it and give you a cut. And of course, Trump ridiculously, probably in his pea brain thought, well, my evangelical followers will just love this, a Trump Bible. So, but, but in reality, what this does is it just shows him not only to be a grifter, but sa a sacrilegious grifter. This is going to blow up in his face, I think, these things. And, and and the question I have is, is the Biden campaign ever going to make an ad out of all of these things? You know, and, and I hope that they will, because I think that if you string together four or five of Trump selling pieces of his suit and selling, you know, trading cards and and Bibles, that that would really be an impactful commercial in you know October. Well, you, you cut some together and we showed it a few weeks ago, didn't we? And yeah. I. Uh, we didn't show it all because there was about five minutes of this kind of constant products and him in a different suit and tie at a different angle, selling another product. And when you put them all together, as exactly as you say, it just makes him seem like a used car salesman. Exactly. It takes away all those presidential moments, you know, meetings of with royalty or standing on the balcony in the White House looking at the sun. It takes away all of that and it just brings, brings him down to where he really is at who this guy really is. He he is a, a TV advertorial salesman. And we have never, ever had a former president do this. Uh, no. Never in our history. I mean, presidents have come out and they've done books, right? They've, they've right. sold books. They've signed different deals to be spokespeople for where they'll go to um, give motivational speeches, things like that. But we have never had, you know, Barack Obama's not on TV selling Colgate toothpaste. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's a, a thing in Britain. I can't imagine a former prime minister of Britain selling products no. on television. It's no. just, but this this man is completely and utterly shameless. So, so this, this is who another... he was before he beca that's accidentally right. became president. And it's who he, in his soul, continues to be. And and so you'll never take the infomercial out of the Trump. That's what this boils down to. Uh, that's, let's, that's a good point. Let's talk yeah. about Carrie Lake because she has uh, finally, after all these months of uh, you know standing her ground, she's finally surrendered on the uh, defamation lawsuit. Um, she said she she felt it. Uh, she participated in the trial. Uh, it would give the people who brought the case credibility. Is uh, what she claims. Um, let's just have a little listen to her. It's only a short clip, and then you can explain why you think she's taken this position. It is a political witch hunt, and everyone knows it. By participating in this lawsuit, it would only serve to legitimize this perversion of our legal system and allow bad actors to interfere in our upcoming election. So I won't be taking part. It's going to put some Vaseline on our lenses as well, you know, <laughs> just to really give us that, that matinee idol look because <laughs> it works very well for her. I don't think I've ever seen her in focus. She's disappearing on us. Yeah. Well, this is, she's got herself in the, this has been a hell of a mess and she's trying to navigate her way out of the mess that she put herself in, in the middle of a Senate campaign. And I think she knew that yesterday was going to be dicey. There were not that many media outlets that called this for what it is, which is a complete and total surrender. We were the first one that did that. Yeah. And Midas, you know, we put the story out right away and said, this is a surrender. And she immediately pushed back and responded to our story and said that it's not true. But she's just spinning. What's going on here is. After her loss, when she lost the election, she did what Trump did in 2020. She was defaming the elections officials in Maricopa County and Stephen Richer, who's the, the, the recorder there, uh, who she was mostly going after with her ridiculous claims, uh, sued her for defamation. And Kerry has been fighting this all the way, motions, appeals, and she's run up. She's, she's at the end of the line. The judge is dismissed and thrown out all of her different attempts to stall or delay this. And it was about to go to trial. And she knew that this trial was going to be a disaster for her, make her look terrible. And it's in the middle of her Senate campaign. So she needed to figure out a way to get out of this. So 
the best thing, instead of settling the case, because we know in MAGA you're not allowed to ever settle or concede anything, that's not done. So she couldn't do that. So instead, she did this weird thing where she just filed a motion with the court and said, I don't want a trial. I'm not going to fight liability. Let's go straight to damages and have a jury determine how much I have to pay this guy. And then she claims that that is not a loss. <laughs> Uh, so I don't think she's fooling anybody. And that's what I told her last night. You're, you're, this spin is not fooling anyone. You're, you know, if you, if she could just be honest once in her life, she might stop losing votes. I'll be honest. I find her absolutely fascinating. I really do as a, as a, you know, as a complete, you know, weird individual, you know, who, she's got that kind of news anchor thing where you, you know, maintain that kind of stiff upper lip. And, you know, you, you, your head doesn't move. She's always perfectly poised and perfectly turned out. But the stuff that she says is, is so is untrue. It's just simply untrue and, and can be proven time and time again. And the people of Arizona don't even really like her. I mean, that's the impression that I get as well, is she's not as popular as she tells us she is. She does that thing that Trump does. You know, when she's whenever I'm walking down the street, people are always coming up to me and saying, oh, Carrie, Carrie. And, Trump's the same, you know, he's like, people say, people say, and it's like, well, who, who, who which people, <laughs> where do you even meet people? And, and so do you get a sense that she knows that she's grifting or is she so mentally and emotionally compromised that she just has to stay on this road for her own sanity? That That's a good question. I mean, you're right. She's not easily rattled by tough questions from reporters. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes she has been, but it's very rare to see uh, somebody get under her skin and rattle her because, like you said, she's she's been in this business for a long time. Yeah. Um, the biggest mistake she made was going after John McCain and and the and the Arizona Republican establishment, Doug Ducey, the old guard in Arizona, because. Even though MAGA is ascendant everywhere and Trumpism is ascendant everywhere, there is still a decent chunk of the Arizona Republican Party that is not MAGA and that still likes John McCain and Doug Ducey and who was the former governor and her going to war with them and just saying, I don't need you. I don't need your votes. You're all scum. That's what she did in 2022 because she convinced herself that she really didn't need them, that she she overwhelmingly was going to win this race and then it didn't happen. So what is she doing now? She's trying to make amends. She's trying to repair that bridge and, you know, let's let bygones be bygones. I'm, I'm a different person now. <laughs> you know, she's trying to reinvent herself for like the fourth time. And the McCain family has already said, you know, I think uh, Megan McCain texted no peace bitch <laughs> in right. response to her olive branch. So uh, I think it's going to be very, very difficult. And, and you know, the, the officials that she's continuing to attack, these elections officials are Republicans too. So it's going to be very, very difficult for her to get those people back to vote for her again. There is a snowball effect to MAGA lies. So, you know, in the first year or two that this stuff was happening, 2016, 2017, the, the, you know, there weren't that many lies that had been told yet. So people were kind of more likely to believe things. They couldn't cross-reference things. There wasn't like video evidence of them saying something differently previously. But now, you know, we are, we're like, we're like what, seven, eight years into this garbage. And so there is so much contradictory evidence to a lot that is being said. And I'm just trying to get into the minds of, of traditional Republicans who might not buy Trump memorabilia and go to the rallies, but from what I'm seeing, especially some of the clips that are doing the rounds of, of, of Republicans, you know, talking, traditional conservatives talking, a lot of them are saying, you know, I just don't buy this stuff anymore. You know, he promised us all this stuff. We never got it. He's out for himself. And it's the same with Carrie Lake, that, that, that you know, it's all talk and no action. And after seven or eight years of all talk, no action, I think what were voters are now going to probably put their check in a different box. What I sense too is from, you know, the average swing independent voter is the biggest lie of all. You know, we could take all the lies about him promising an infrastructure yeah. plan, repeal Obamacare, whatever you want to take. If you if you took all the lies, the one that th seems to bother them the most is him claiming that he won the election. 
you know, right. him, it, he refuses to let that go. And, and I can tell you that all of his advisors, all the senators, all the congressmen have told him and Hannity, people in the media have told him, you have to stop talking about 2020. You have to let this go. And the reason why they're telling him that is because they hear this too, that, that that's the number one thing I think that a lot of these swing voters are saying is, we are so sick and tired of Trump continuing to claim he won the 2020 election, but I don't think he can stop. He's he hasn't stopped a, a, given an inch. And yeah. even when interviewers that are friends of him say, don't you think it's time to move on? He gets upset at them. That's right. So I don't see him being able to move on. And, and that's a big Achilles heel. And and it's hurting Carrie Lake, too, for she can't uh, concede that she lost 2022. It's his default position. Because it's a bit like a comedian who's trying out new material. You know, the new material is one or two jokes, but really your act is the main 20 minutes. And his act is that, you know, the 2020 election was stolen and I'm the rightful president and Joe Biden is, is uh, you know, not the, not the real guy and Obama's running the show and all those, all those gags that he does. The, the, his, Migrant his crime. Yeah, yeah, he's all got, these, you know, all Afghanistan, the same, the same lines, right? the same stuff yep. over and over, and and so he can't, he simply can't help it. And as he gets older and more compromised, whether it be dementia or whether it be age or just stress, that he will, like old comedians, he will just fall back on his stock material. We should say that we don't mention polls because they're mostly garbage, but Biden yep. is pushing ahead. Uh, nationwide. And we should also mention Marilyn Lands, who won a, a decisive victory in a state house district that Donald Trump narrowly won in, in 2020. Uh, this was on, on, on Tuesday, an Alabama state house seat in a long held Republican district, notching a, a special election victory after centering her campaign on promoting access to abortion and IVF. I mean, this is massive. This is a massive, massive deal. And I think that to underestimate what Democrats are capable of, considering that, you know, women's rights are human rights, Fa you know, families, all the stuff that, that, you know, woman's right to choose at the center of democratic campaigning. You can't really win against that, considering that the Supreme Court judgment has come since Donald Trump won last time. Look, I, I've become a convert on this on this issue uh, because I was a little skeptical that I thought that the Roe versus Wade getting overturned was going to be very impactful in the 2022 midterms. But I thought that as time went on, maybe by 2024, a lot of that anger was going to wear off. And uh, you, I was going to dissipate. You men, you underestimate us women. I, uh, I'm telling you. <laughs> I, look, the numbers are the numbers are proving me wrong pretty yeah. consistently on that. Well, I, I didn't know. I just wasn't sure, you know, but but I, I know now. And that, that's why I actually tweeted today that, you know, when you look at all these results, whether you go to the New York, uh, the Santos seat, you know, you, you go all the way around the country, special elections, Andy Bashir there in Kentucky, even the, the Republican primaries. The polls with ha involving Haley versus Trump, the polls have been consistently wrong and they've been consistently wrong favoring the Republican candidates, whether it's Trump or anybody else. They keep polling higher than their vote totals in race after race after race, including the race last night. And what these exit polls continue to show time and time again is that the abortion, the IVF, the reproductive rights issue has become a dominant issue in almost every race and people who run on it. And, and this woman made this the centerpiece of her campaign uh, are winning. And, and I think also you have to look at the Democrats have put abortion on as ballot initiatives on the ballot in November, 2024 in many States. And I said, you know, I think that clearly the most impactful ads down the stretch in this campaign are going to be ads of Donald Trump, bragging about overturning Roe versus no one else could do it I got it done yep. they said it couldn't ever be done but I did it again the the insecurity the the, the narcissistic personality will lose him the election those are going to be the best ads and I think the Biden campaign is well aware of that I'm not I'm not breaking any news to them they they knew it before I did put it that way <laughs>
there is now, though, um, a, a bit of a uh, pivot from Donald Trump about abortion. So now he's saying that, you know, he supports 16 weeks. Yeah, sure. So so talk, talk to me about the backtracking and, and yeah, the advice course, that well, he's probably getting on this. Because he sees the same numbers we see. You know, he, he, he gets even better, better numbers because he's commissioning with what little money he has. He's commissioning internal polls on this stuff that are usually more accurate than media polls. And he's he's seeing the numbers. He's well aware that this is a massive problem for him which is why he thinks he can talk his way out of this problem. You know, that's that's what he continues to say in interview after interview is his line is Republicans just don't know how to talk about this. And and I do. And and I know how to how to present this in a way that will convince American people that I'm that I'm with them on this issue. He's full of crap. He doesn't know how to talk about this issue. He he's delusional. And uh, this is going to and and by the way, he can't get himself out from under. It's the same thing with Carrie Lake in Arizona. She can't get out from under all the horrible things she said about the McCain Republicans in Arizona because it's all on tape. Trump can't do it either with the abortion issue. There's yeah. too many clips of him. Bra- and, and when he when he brags about this are to evangelical groups, when he's at these yeah. prayer groups and these and these Christian groups, that's when he's bragging about overturning Roe. And those are those are on video. He also doesn't have the vocabulary or the language to be able to communicate on this subject. He might claim that he does, no. but he, he literally hasn't got a clue. And, you know, how dare he pack the court, get Roe overturned and then attempt to backtrack? How dare he? Should just Considering own the number yeah. of women and families that are having to deal with the consequences of of the abortion ban. How dare he? Because a backtrack at this stage is actually going to look even worse than him standing his ground. It, it, it does. And and his the way he thinks that he needs to talk about this issue, I'll prove that it's wrong. I mean, his his solution is every time anybody brings up abortion to immediately stop talk about late term, after birth, partial birth, abortion yeah. stuff. That's his default. That He thinks that Every time he gets asked an abortion question, all he needs to do is say, Democrats want to want to kill babies at nine months. And that's going to be the winning formula for him. Women don't buy that. No. They don't think that that's happening. Well, nobody does. Not even not even Republicans who have half a brain. It's only yeah. the 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 cult members that, that buy into that stuff. And right. You know, that's what's so sad about this is that, you know, after a while, his rhetoric becomes so extreme and so extravagant that it goes beyond the realms of reality. So, you know, he'll start campaigning for his time travel machine soon. And he'll be like, you know, I've built this machine. Everyone's talking about it. It can take you back to 1955. And, I, you know, I, I need to raise money. And because that's how it feels to me right now is that we're at a point where it is so fantastical that people are going to start to be like, you know something, this, this really doesn't add up. Yeah. And the problem with him wanting to take the position of a 15-week national ban and you see what he's doing is he's dipping his toe in that. Yeah. He'll come out in interviews and he'll say he's looking at that. So he hasn't right. actually come out and said that that's what he favors and they don't press him on it. So he he just wiggles off the hook and just says, well, I'm thinking about that. The problem, the reason why he's not, he, he would love to go all in on that and say, yes, this is what I want, because that might mollify some of the more moderate voters. But he can't because the base of his party would rebel. They would revolt. They do not want. 15 weeks. They want zero weeks, right? They, well, they want, they want all abortion ban. They don't want a 15 yeah. week ban. So, so this is the problem for Donald Trump is he wants to come out for a 15 week ban now, but he can't because his own party hates that idea. Especially after they installed Mike Johnson as speaker, whose job it is to rally and whip and all that stuff. I mean, Johnson you know, would never he, go along with that. No way. So- they are cannibalizing themselves. You know, I, I really see this takeover of the Republican Party by by MAGA is causing a slow motion implosion, Ron. 
like we're actually seeing this slow motion implosion, which might be the title of my book. <laughs> and, and I'm kind of enjoying it because it's a mess. And, and what we get out the other side is, is normality, hopefully, and, and, and going back to a time when this insanity of alternative facts and, 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 and just a, a completely parallel narrative to, to, to the truth, that needs to go. I mean, it, it, it's untenable. You can't continue with a, with, a, with a parallel universe of insanity like this. It's, it's, it's screwing us all up. If you, if you were asking me to predict like how this is going to unravel, if it does unravel yeah. is, you know, it's going to be three, a three stage process. Number one, Trump has to lose the election. Okay. Because if Trump wins, then MAGA's ascendant, right? Yeah. So, oh, sorry. My camera went out there. That's okay. Uh, I love seeing the little picture of you with hair. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a treat for us all. If Trump wins, uh, MAGA's ascendant. So, uh, you know, that's, that's not going to happen. Um, that's the first part. Part number two is then he has to go away. He has to either go to prison, um, die of natural causes. Go to ground. Or, he has to be house gone. House arrest. He has to be gone. Correct. Yeah. Uh, then what's going to happen is there's going to be a civil war between people who want to be his successor, people who are going to step up and say, I'm MAGA now, I'm the leader. And they're all going to start battling each other and they're going to tear each other apart. And that's going to be the end of it. That's if it's going to end, that's how it has to end. But you have the first step is he has to lose the selection. And I, I would reference the interview or the third of the interviews that I've done with um, Dr. Bandy Lee, who is the uh, forensic psychiatrist who diagnosed his malignant narcissism. And she says that once you remove the ringleader, yeah. that people will default to their pre cult selves because she sees this in prisons when she works with gangs in prisons. And it's very interesting, the idea that if Trump is not there anymore, what happens to his, his cult members? And, and, and her scientific explanation is that they, they will go back to their, to, to their previous position of hopefully of, of more moderation. It's very interesting, isn't it? The, the low, the, the, the normal, the average person will do that. Yeah. But the, the grifters, the, the, the influencers, the leaders will not, you know, they'll, they'll hang on and they'll, they'll try and succeed. But they'll struggle. They'll It'll struggle be like, because... like a, a Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar. Anytime right. one of these people, tyrants, you know, who die or are killed, there's this succession struggle. And if one strong person doesn't emerge from that struggle to take over, everything comes unglued, which is what happened in Alexander the Great's case, but did not happen in Julius Caesar's case because yeah, Caesar Augustus uh, inherited the mantle and was even stronger than him. So, so you look throughout history, there's lots of these examples, yeah. But in this situation, Trump is such an unusual, such an anomaly in terms of his, uh, you know, his, his mental pathology, his, you know, his, his psych psychiatric issues, his greed, his childhood, his exposure to wealth, his narcissistic personality, like all of these things, it's like a perfect storm. And whilst the surrogates might have aspects of those things, there isn't another Donald Trump at the moment that has presented themselves, somebody who is as evil or somebody who is completely emotionless and lacks empathy. You know, we just, he is an, he is an anomaly, like a once in a, in a lifetime character to present himself and to really disrupt American politics as he has. There, there is no successor. There's no successor to Trump. Not even I mean, all, you have all these pretenders and all these people who think that they're going to be successors, like yeah. Tucker Carlson or Ron DeSantis or these people. It doesn't exist. You're right. This is a unique situation. Let's talk about uh, the um, collapsed sham impeachment of Joe Biden and Hunter Biden and this whole uh, sham that's been going on for, for months now, which they were trying to kind of keep going till election time to, you know, try and put a cloud over the heads of the anyone with the surname Biden. It's not worked out for them, has it? Let's take a little look at, uh, at uh, James Comer's latest excuse. 
We've been, again, referring back and forth to the testimony that we've heard, that we've aired here live on National Report, and again, statements that were made. Um, all this in regards to the impeachment inquiry. I'm curious to know what you say to those that push back and say there's no, there's no appetite in the House and definitely not the Senate for an impeachment. Perhaps there would be criminal referrals moving forward, but then you'd be met with another uh, barrier, if you will, of the statute of limitations, meaning where are you attempting to go at this point, Congressman? Well, I want to hold accountability. Uh, that's what we said all along. We said when we launched the investigation, we want to provide the truth to the American people and then provide real accountability. So what does real accountability look like? Does it look like impeaching Joe Biden in the House and then the Senate tabling it like they're going to do with the Merrick Garland impeachment? Or does it mean providing real criminal referrals to the Department of Justice? Uh, I think the latter. Uh, look, I would vote to impeach Joe Biden right now. Uh, the impeachment inquiry was meant to give us more tools to be able to gather more information to be able to win in court uh, when the Bidens challenged our lawful subpoenas. We've done all that. We've gotten the evidence that the Bidens were influence peddling. They never paid a penny of taxes on it. Joe Biden's lied uh, over a dozen times about his knowledge of uh, who his family was doing business with and uh, the fact that he did communicate often with the people. So now we want to hold accountability. And I believe that the best path to accountability is criminal referrals. And <laughs> good luck. Good luck with that, James. I mean, I've, I've watched so many Comer interviews, hundreds of Comer interviews, and that what he just said there is totally different than what he said in every other interview, <laughs> because that's how, you know, no matter what he's trying to say, that's a surrender right there. Yeah. Because what he said in every other interview is that the end result of this was going to be a vote on impeaching Joe Biden. That was what was going to be the end. And so he was just asked at the end of his investigation. Now he's asked what is going to happen next? And what he he say, there will be no vote on impeachment because Johnson doesn't want it. Republican House leadership doesn't want it. Only the wing nuts want it because it won't pass. For one thing, it'll be it'll be humiliation to him and to the leadership, and they can't stand many more acts of humiliation. So, so what is he trying to do here? He's trying to save face by saying he's going to make a criminal referral. Okay, well, any you know that big deal. Okay, so you know that goes to DOJ. But, you know, the first reaction to everybody was, well, that'll go nowhere because Merrick Garland is going to is not going to do anything with with this criminal referral. But then what came out a few days later was now what they're saying is they're going to hold on to the criminal referral and they're going to wait. And if Trump wins the election and they remain in the majority, then they will forward the criminal referral on Joe Biden to Trump's new attorney general. Now that is a dangerous proposition because then Joe Biden actually could be indicted by a corrupt sec new Trump attorney general. I, I, I don't think they're going to get that far. And I don't think that there will be a Trump or a Trump attorney general um, administration but the point that you make is interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, Trump ran his last Justice Department like it was, uh, you know, an extension of his personal lawyer, switching out attorney generals. We had Jeff Sessions recusing himself that time, and that all got very awkward. And in the end, you know, switching someone out even in the last two weeks when there wasn't even any government to be, you know, operating, which was just proof that he needed somebody in place to do his bidding in the event of the insurrection and the coup. And, I mean, and that man, by the way, that yeah. Trump was trying to install as his attorney general in the final weeks to overturn the election, Jeff Clark, was pleading the fifth 30-something times today in his disbarment hearing in D.C. I thought you were going to say in his underpants, because, of course, Jeffrey <laughs> Clark famously was uh, awoken in the middle of the night and forced to stand in his front yard in just his undercrackers. That's the guy. Rather, yeah, rather brilliant. Uh, he was he all he did was plead the fifth today in his bar okay. hearing. So, yeah, I mean, that's the guy that Trump wanted to make attorney general to, and he wanted to go start seizing voting machines. So, yes, look, uh, that's what's at stake, though. The reality is that's what's at stake is that if Trump wins, he's going to have a an insane attorney general. There's going to be no more Bill Bars, no more Jeff Sessions. 
it's going to be nuts like the guy in his underwear pleading the fifth will be running DOJ. And I wouldn't put it past them to try and indict Joe Biden, you know, who would be what, 80 something years old. They, you know, they put him in handcuffs. Can you believe that you just referenced Bill Barr and Jeff Sessions as upstanding former attorney generals? <laughs> just, Hold think, on. just think about that for a moment, Philip Kowski, because no, if, no, that's no. What it's, if that's how low the bar is now. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, there's lines that they would not cross. Uh, the, admittedly, the, those lines were, you know, sometimes a little crazy. Yeah. But they at least they had some lines. Um, the next uh, Trump AG will not have any lines. Marjorie Taylor Greene is not happy, and uh, she's not happy with Mike Johnson. She's not happy about more Republicans standing down. Let's take a look at one of these clips. That's how we lose the majority, not because Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a motion to vacate against a Republican speaker that betrayed everyone worse than any Republican speaker in decades. That I'm not the problem here. Well, that's a matter of opinion. Um, tell us what she's referring to here. So I knew that when I first heard that Mike Johnson was made a deal with Democrats on the budget, I uh, knew that that these Freedom Caucus people, right wingers, were going to be all really furious and upset. And so I thought to myself, you know, who who how can we get one of them to file a motion to vacate Mike Johnson, you know, and who would that person be? And, and I, when I went through the list, Gates, isn't going to do it again. He's already said that the person who jumped out, the name who jumped out to me was Marjorie Taylor green. And, and, and I thought, because for a number of reasons, be, number one, she was a Kevin McCarthy loyalist. She has never liked Mike Johnson. Okay. Uh, She's upset. She's crumbled and complained about him that they never should have gotten rid of McCarthy, et cetera, et cetera. So she's never been on board with Johnson, which is surprising because you would have thought they'd be quite well aligned because but... she, because she she still has that loyalty to McCarthy. She felt like those Freedom Caucus people double crossed her, that she had this tight relationship that she had developed with McCarthy. And that was all out the window because of her her own friends. And remember, they kicked her out of the Freedom Caucus after the McCarthy vote. They got yes. rid of her. So there's that, too. So I, I immediately started needling her on social media, and I know that she reads my stuff. Um, and and I, I started saying, you know, how can how can you let this go? How, how can you just sit back? And, and I started posting, like, who is going to be the first member of Congress to do a motion to vacate? And I was following her very closely in everything that she was saying and doing in the days leading up to the vote and um, knew that she, knew that she was going to do this. I, I, I pretty much had it from uh, some reliable sources behind the scenes in her camp that she was going to do this. So I, I really was sort of hoping she would do it. I was needling her to do it. But the question is, what now? OK, so that's the other thing I said right after she did it was, is this just a stunt? Is this just you're not going to call it up for a vote? You're just going to use this for to get a bunch of interviews over the, the Easter break, which she has been doing interview after interview over this. Or is this for real? Now, she's not backing down in these interviews. She continues to say, like, we need to get this man out of there. Or we don't I don't want him. But but I'm not so sure that she has anybody else on her team on this there i think probably what she was hoping is maybe over the break three or four other crazies like tim burchett or some of these other ones would jump on the bandwagon but they haven't she went on um uh, steve bannon's podcast uh, which as we know he recently has been referencing uh, midas touch and you know there's a whole interesting kind of back and forth there they've started to realize that midas touch is a is a threat to their you know to their the Republican vote because we're the fastest and the quickest and the most efficient and, and, and bringing the facts to the table, which, you know, we're all very proud of, especially you, Ron, with, with MidasTouch.com. But here she goes on the show and she says that Representative Mike Gallagher, who's announced that he's leaving Congress in, in April, should be expelled from the House immediately since he put the Republican majority at risk. 
Let's take a look. We're in a very dangerous situation, Steve. What Mike Gallagher did yesterday was intentional, purposeful, and puts our entire majority at risk. Um, I think he should be expelled uh, preeminently before he's allowed to just walk out of Congress at a date of his choosing where his district doesn't get to replace him um, until next Congress. I think that is completely wrong. I think people uh, should should be able to have a voice. His district deserves a voice in Congress, and we should expel him, and, and that way his district can replace him as quickly as possible with a special election. Um, our majority is too important to throw away, and the and the horrible, um, dishonest, and and completely irresponsible actions of many in our Republican majority have led us to where we are. When people leave early, it's a math game. They're the ones that put us put us at. Yeah, um, it's a whole lot of noise, but you know, maybe I should ask you first: Why are Republicans dropping off like flies? Well, first of all, she has a good point, because if Gallagher would leave now, OK, uh, they could ha would have a special election and they would fill his seat in the next couple of months. But he has chosen to backdate the date that he leaves until after the deadline for a special election, which means that this because of the date he chose to leave. Uh, he cannot be replaced until next year, until the end of the year. So that's what she's fuming about is that and 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 she's not the only one, by the way. She's the only one who has called for him to be expelled. But the other ones are all out there complaining about his date of resignation. And when you look at how he timed this and how Ken Buck tied his resignation to hose Lauren Boebert, uh, you see a pattern here Yeah, that these strategy. people are leaving. They seem to know about each other leaving. So they're seem, <laughs> they seem to be communicating and they seem to be timing it in a way that's screwing over their own party. And I think they're doing that for a reason. They're leaving because they know that this is a dysfunctional crew and they, and they want to disarm it and make sure that they can't do any more harm. Do they want them to lose the next election? I mean, does it go that far? Do you think that there is, you know, a mutiny in the ranks where they recognize that actually Republicans, considering that they've been overtaken by the, the, the MAGA arm, they've been radicalized, that actually that, that could see the long-term collapse of the GOP? I, I think that many of them wouldn't be upset to see th their own party lose the majority. And, yeah. and I think that what we're going to see is we're going to see more. I don't with, even with all the retirements and there, I think the Republicans are up to like 30 retirements now. Uh, and most of these other retirements are leaving at the end of the year. Uh, but I think there's going to be a couple of more that are going to happen um, as we come after we come back from Easter and two more flips the house. So, and that's, that's their greatest fear. So, I think that that's also why Johnson felt like he had to get this budget passed, because if he didn't go along with this and there was a shutdown, I think those handful of other members who are planning on leaving, thinking about leaving, would have left and turned the house over to Jeffrey. So I think he had no choice. Let's talk about this very tragic uh, crash that happened, this uh, bridge disaster in Baltimore which uh, the, the, the scope even widened today. Six construction workers were declared to be dead. Uh, investigators recovered the black box from the ship, uh, whose, whose crash has brought one of America's busiest ports to a, to a grinding halt. There's going to be a knock-on effect now with supply chain as well. The saddest part of this story, aside from the fatalities, is the conspiracy theories, is how Republicans are coming out on mass and blaming diversity, equity, and inclusion, blaming brown people from driving the, you know, piloting the, the ship, bridge construction. I even saw some Buddhist, conspiracies Buddhist, Buddhist, Buddhist. Yeah, about, about, yeah. about COVID, that, you know, that people had long COVID and because of the vaccine, it had made their brains foggy, and therefore I they. I saw they one that the that the ship captain was Ukrainian, even. Yeah, because, and saying <laughs> they wasn't. 
Right, they were saying, oh, the ship was on its way to India. The ship had only been out of port for 20 minutes before it lost power and lost steering. It made a call to the authorities to get them to clear the bridge, and they did a pretty good job of that. But unfortunately, there were workers on the bridge, and there were a few vehicles on the bridge. It was a huge bridge. I mean, it didn't from, from a distance, that bridge looked pr- pretty janky, in itself, didn't it? I'd never seen a bridge that is, you know, looks so flimsy, but it literally went down like a toy. Terribly tragic, and yet the this response has been to use racism and xenophobia to describe it. And and even Lara uh, Logan, b- big favorite of yours, claimed that the bridge was a terrorist attack. Here she is. Words. Right. I'm talking to people who are on the inside, some who are on active duty, some who are retired and everyone literally from critical infrastructure in Department of Homeland Security to the intelligence agencies. They know there's no other. It, it's there. This is a cyber attack on a critical infrastructure corridor for the United States. This is, you know, for those people who think this is just a river, this is in Baltimore. What does this matter? You don't know anything about what you're talking about. This, the I-94 corridor on the Eastern seaboard is literally what connects the North and South. And when I talk about hazardous materials, right? This is a brilliant, well-planned strategic attack on one of the most important supply chains in the United States of America. The only other one is in the Western side in California. That's the only one that's busier. And what you have done, you, you now have shut it down. And when I talk about hazardous materials, what are we talking about here? This is refined fuels, right? This is propane gas. This is diesel. This is fuel. This is flammable materials. This is oversized loads, nitrogen, chemicals, everything that you need for your economy to move has literally just been shut down for four to five years. And, and She is a terrible person. I mean, this kind of propaganda, which has no basis in truth, is only going to do more of what the Republicans and the and the far right media do, which is to put fear into people, to scare people, and to you know make people go out and buy more guns. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. I mean, we could do a whole show on this, you know, whole yeah. thing. I I think we, we we should talk for a few minutes about the Laura Logan saga for a second too, but. First of all, we've talked before about migrants and the fact that they are out there every single day, often unseen, unheard, doing some of the most difficult, arduous jobs that Americans do not want to do for low pay, physically demanding jobs. And the six people who died, apparently, were migrants. Uh, yes. They were from six different countries, mostly in Latin America, who are working on this bridge. So you know, that that's that's just a, a footnote to this story that we should mention. And we but, should also quickly mention that there's been a, a, a White House press briefing with Pete Buttigieg uh, and the U.S. Coast Guard this morning. And um, Karine Jean-Pierre gave an update. She said, our hearts go out to the families of the six individuals missing after yesterday's bridge collapse in Maryland. Operations have shifted from a search and rescue operation to recovery efforts. President Biden has been briefed on the collapse adding that he has pledged to move heaven and earth to aid in the emergency emergency response and help rebuild the bridge as soon as humanly possible. I mean, he said that this will be covered with federal funds, didn't he? Yeah. But again, I want to go back to the conspiracy. Sorry, sorry I'm oh, just getting, yeah, yeah. Getting, the, getting the housekeeping out of the way. Yeah. OK, because there's a lot here to talk about. Sure. Uh, yeah. Whenever there's any kind of disaster or tragedy or issue of any kind anywhere in the world, the first reaction of a MAGA Republican is to blame Joe Biden, blame the United States, blame our policies, blame whoever's in government. Um, you know, that that that's what they do every single time and launch the conspiracies. And this was no exception. I mean, they went after they 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 immediately when something like this happens, they immediately want to find out who the captain of the ship is. You know, they, they want to blame. They're hoping it's. Yeah. A brown person or a black person or a Ukrainian or yeah. or or somebody that that they can that feeds their narrative, a gay person. You know, it's the yeah. same thing with an airline crash. You know, they always want the pilot to be black. This or is the derailment what, at what uh, East do. Palestine as well. Right. They always are looking for someone to blame that fits their xenophobic racist narratives. 
and they haven't given up on this either. These conspiracies are still going uh, uh, today on this on this tanker ship. So it's just a horrible thing, but it's also something that I think discredits their movement. And sometimes people ask me why I post these wacky conspiracies because these people share stages with elected officials. They do fundraisers for them. They they you know have their arms around them. They're friends with them. So it's important to discredit the entire movement. You can't just go after elected officials in Donald Trump. This is why, as you mentioned, people like Charlie Kirk and Steve Bannon are coming after Midas Touch now because they recognize that our mission is not just to go after Trump. Our mission is to go after the entire movement and discredit the whole movement. And so this is part of it. Now to the Laura Logan thing, because yeah. this is... This is sort of most people know her or remember her as a war correspondent, a 60 Minutes reporter and a quite good one at both. And if you look at her, her saga that, you know, she had a rep, she her how she made her claim to fame was being utterly fearless. She she was a woman who um, had won, you know, beauty contests in South Africa and was known for in, in that world for a while who went into television journalism but wasn't a prima donna, you know, wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't a diva. She went headfirst into war zones. So she was so, so much so that most people would refuse to work with her. Men, uh, even security details did not want to work with her because she continued to put herself in incredibly dangerous situations over and over again, which also made her rocket to stardom. But eventually, you know, that, that ran out on her when she was in Egypt uh, during their their uprising when they, their government was overthrown, and she was in a huge crowd, and um, she was she was sexually assaulted by the whole crowd, you know, many people in the crowd. Now a lot of people are going to say that you know she went uh, began to unravel psychologically after that. I don't believe that that's true though. I think it's been fairly well documented that. She was starting to go down the right wing conspiracy rabbit holes a few years before that. Now, that may have made things worse psychologically for her, but she was already going down that road. And I, I think mo what some of the reporting has shown is she she had the current her current husband is once she started dating him, who was a pretty big conspiracy theorist. That's when it all started with her. And she's just completely gone now. She's been banned from every network. She can't go on Fox. She can't go on Newsmax. Everyone is terrified of getting sued because of her, her the things that she says. And it's similar with uh, Gavin Newsom's ex-wife, Kimberly Guifoyle. It's like, he's like, she wasn't like that when I was married to her, you know? And, and, and clearly people can be radicalized and yeah. it's happening all the time. Um, yeah. Just, you know, off the back of these conspiracies, as you say, there are more and more that are appearing on social media all the time. And, and, and tragically, I mean, that's what Truth Social is really about, isn't it? It's just a place for these types of ideas to land. But the fact that there, that, that there isn't really any consideration for the humanity in this story, because, you know, humans are imperfect. Ships lose power. You know, and and it's it's quite normal. There's plenty of memes of cruise ships smashing into into pontoons. You know, it's like it's not an exact science. And unfortunately, when you've got a a container ship of that size and it's got momentum, nothing is going to stop it. And you know, sometimes we just have to accept that there are accidents, non-preventable accidents that happen in life, and. Not everything warrants a conspiracy theory. Yep. And, you know, these guys all do their own research. You know, within a few hours, they're all nautical and, yeah, experts. you know, engineering experts. Yeah. Uh, and they're all, we're all weighing in with their opinions. And and I, I think you have to ask sometimes, are they doing it for clicks? Because most of the people who are leading these, who do these things are monetized accounts if you go to their pages, you'll see subscribe here. You know, yeah. they're all monetized. But so what Elon has done with this monetization of Twitter is incentivize conspiracies because conspiracies get clicks. Posting fake videos and making outrageous claims get clicks and clicks make you money now. And so that that's what is happening. 
So I think some of these people actually believe their their nonsense, but but I think a lot of them are doing this in a very cynical way. They're doing it for money. And again, hopefully, people who do have a, a soul, Republican or Democrat, will recognize the more of this stuff that continues to happen, it's actually not good business for the Republican Party. And, and you know, it doesn't help. I actually saw Victor Davis Hanson being interviewed about, about it. And he went 100% down the racist route of, of this being because of a, a diverse workforce and you have to employ people who might not be best for the job but because they are the right skin color or the right ethnicity that you know that's why they get the job i mean it was i was just dumbfounded and he's somebody that is always put up as being a scholar and a and an expert and you know he's a mature gentleman in a suit and people tend to listen and it is utter pure it is pure racism Nothing you do more. i mean i do see here and there i think there are people on the right who realize that this is becoming a problem for them yes at the ballot box yes. and and it's discrediting their whole movement and because you do occasionally get these people come out and say this stuff is not helping us you guys need to knock this off but you know generally they're shouted down they're they're not in the majority uh, sticking with this subject, let's talk about Kyle Rittenhouse. This is the uh, young man <laughs> vigilante who went to a BLM protest and ended up shooting two people and, and uh, killing them and getting away with it. He's um, been on a tour of, uh, what is it, it's like universities, right? He went to the University of Memphis. There was this huge uproar. A lot of um, kind of young, black, energized people went to listen to him and they gave him a piece of their mind he eventually left the stage with his uh, emotional support animal and then afterwards claimed that actually he was um, you know he chose to leave and they were over time anyway let's uh, listen to a little clip of him getting system that the university implement implemented to the protesters so i showed up to a room full of protesters booing me and calling me a murderer because the university censored turning point and took away their ticketing system and only allowed protesters and demonstrators in Whoa. and I wasn't able to give a speech. I, and I, I spoke for about two minutes and they kept screaming at me. So, yeah. Uh, I, I watched a lot of those clips, you know, he was spouting far right propaganda on stage and people weren't standing for it. This has been, you know, I've followed the Rittenhouse saga here for a while Believe me, if he goes away, I'm going to leave the kid alone. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about him anymore, but he doesn't, he won't go away. So as long as he continues to be a, a prominent person in this movement, I'm going to keep doing this. Um, but, but I would prefer to have him go away. I, I really would. This is somebody I don't want to talk about, but, I, but I feel like I have to. So after, you know, of course in the trial, he said he was, he told the jury he was going to go to nursing school in Arizona. That never happened. Then he was supposed to be going to go to become a pilot at, at Texas A&M. Uh, he wanted to fly for Federal Express. That never happened. Uh, and then he just decided he 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 came up with he with a video game. He came out with a book. He was going to sue Joe Biden. You know, he's had all these grifts, none of which have panned out very well. Um, he had a new girlfriend for a while. Haven't seen her in quite a while. That he was flaunting around. Um, he was even at Miralago with Laura Logan at one point. I posted a photo of them together. So now what is he doing? He, he I, So in other words, instead of finding like a normal job or going to school or just having a normal life, he's continuing to try and use this incident of this killing as his career. He, he's building a career off of this incident, which is revolting to me. I mean, I'm careful not to call him murderer because look i'm a criminal lawyer i've been for 30 years I, I he was acquitted so i respect the jury even though i don't agree with the verdict i respect it and there were a lot of problems with that case okay should so, we mention the judge's cell phone ringtone <laughs> yeah it was the trump rally theme song yeah the, the judge was clearly in the tank for rittenhouse didn't like the case but you know i'm careful not to go there with him on that because uh, look the jury found him not guilty but 
But I still think what he did was incredibly reckless, irresponsible, dumb, and and bad. Um, but but you know this 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 is insane to me because what has happened is Charlie Kirk, who is the person as we've talked about many times, who is supposed to be the campus outreach person for the Republican Party to win over Gen Z voters, he's supposed to send these turning point ambassadors and representatives into college campuses to build the Turning Point USA clubs and organizations and groups at these campuses to get young people to vote Republican. And he signed up Kyle Rittenhouse for a, for as one of his TPUSA ambassadors. Could you think of anyone a worse choice to win over undecided college kids than sending this guy in there to speak? And it's backfiring on them. I mean, if you're running the Republican Party, you have to say to Charlie Kirk, what the hell are you doing? You're costing us young votes with this. You're not winning them over. But now Rittenhouse is continuing to do these. I think he's got another one today, these campus tours with, with Charlie Kirk. I had a theory that they know that they're going to get out of hand. They know that it's going to cause trouble. They know that it's going to get press attention. And yeah. that's why they're doing it wrong. And, but, and to think that it's going to go smoothly is is not a, not even a consideration for them. And this is the problem that makes money for them, that gets them clicks, that gets them attention, but it doesn't win elections. Yeah. It loses elections, and that's the that's where they're at a cross purpose. Charlie Kirk is a grifter. Charlie Kirk is interesting in making money. Charlie Kirk doesn't win elections. He loses elections for them. And when you bring Rittenhouse onto the team. That only pours gasoline onto that fire. It, it's, again, it's a sorry state of affairs that you would have to take somebody who was, you know, acquitted in a very questionable circumstances of, of you know, these murders. And yet he became celebrated. He became like a far right superstar. He, he actually was the guest speaker at CPAC that same year. And they, they brought him on with like, lasers and fireworks and music and everybody was like Carl Rittenhouse because you know he was armed with a AR-15 style semi-automatic weapon and and you know he took the law into his own hands I mean if, if that's this was what a guy want. who was an innocent bystander there or a business owner in that yeah. town and defended himself in the in that way that would be one thing but that's not what happened. No, he went. He went looking for a seventeen-year-old kid who was taking the law into his own hands and seen too many movies or played too many video games and put himself and and others at great risk. That that's the difference. Finally, let's talk about um, Donald Trump's great success because he actually has done something wonderful that we can all he celebrate, has. and that is that he has been crowned the club champion and oh. senior club champion. <laughs> <laughs> For the third consecutive year at his at his golf championship, he posted about it, and even Joe Biden decided to quote tweet it and congratulate him and say, "You must be very proud of yourself, Donald." I mean, this is another example of the emptiness inside this man. Let's have a quick look at his rather excellent golf swing. Shanked it. Oh my god, I got that on video. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's who uh, that's who won yet again. I mean, famously, this guy cheats at golf. He cheats at everything, but you know, golf is one of his. You know, apparently, his golf cart goes faster than other golf carts, so that he can get to the ball early and reposition it. So I've heard. Um, Joe Biden did a did a great thing with that tweet and i hope that that is the shape of things to come going forward this kind of dialogue with with trump but what's your take on this i i've chronicled the trump golf game for a long time rick riley this oh, who was a legendary sports illustrated writer wrote a, a, a whole book about it called yeah. commander in cheat chronicling <laughs> how trump cheats at golf and he played golf with trump and and he's got some funny quotes in there from pro golfers like tiger woods who you know, we're, we're making fun of Trump's cheating. Um, but the outrageous thing about this is he continues year after year to win the club championship 
at his golf courses uh, year after and I'm not not the senior championship, not the like 60 plus division. He's winning the whole thing like young guys, uh, it, which is just preposterous. But, you know, it'd be one thing if he comes out sort of tongue in cheek and go, yeah, I won again and makes kind of a joke about it. But no, he's deadly serious. Deadly and he serious. wants yeah. everyone to believe that he legitimately won. He claimed when he won the club championship that he shot a 67 on the last day. Now, that is a professional Go that is a good pro and he's also claimed that he beats pros regularly that pro golfers come out to his courses and play with him and he beats them on a regular basis we know all of these things are completely preposterous ridiculous lies you just saw that swing now when i get most of my, the Trump golf clips I get are because I follow a lot of the people who work at his golf courses on Instagram and social media, and that's how I get them. But they're only putting out his good shots. Yeah. But occasionally I find coming across people like this, it, it's very difficult for anybody to get a, a video like that because you because of Secret Service and these yeah, are you private can't get clubs. Close, right? You have to sneak your way onto the and these were some guys that were hiding in the bushes <laughs> filming him and that's the only way you're going to get you know a, a video of a bad shot. But but I got one. Let's have another look at it just because. shanked it oh my god i got that on video <laughs> he shaved it love that phrase okay it's, listen, it's we, i mean yeah. there's lots of those but they're hard to find man <laughs> yeah well 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 done on your on your scavenging that was a uh, great work um we have to finish but thank you bron great to see you i hope people like our new graphics we've shined things up a bit off the back of the popularity of the show we suddenly had a, a, a budget a budget to put our names at the bottom um uh, it's uh, always a pleasure. We'll come back next Wednesday, do it again. If you want to download the audio version, then you can do that wherever you get your podcasts. That'll be available later tonight. And don't forget to check out the comments uh, down below and uh, put your name to it as well. Share it if you enjoyed it. If you didn't, don't tell anyone. Uh, have a great week, Ron. Take care. See you next week.